wow, did we ever have a huge discussion for the Patreon before we started this mailbag. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the walk-off. It is a Monday morning mailbag on a Tuesday afternoon, and Adam and I, I feel like we did a little self-therapy session like, here. Like 40 we... minutes of therapy, <laughs> for sure, before the mailbag, so... Listen, if, if hold on, if you're a member of Patreon just to support us, but you usually watch it just like through Spotify or YouTube because that's more convenient for you. Hop on over to Patreon today because there was mm -hmm. like a good 35, 40 minutes of. Of actual extra, discussion, extra discussion on, on, Blue Jays. on this team and, and where we're at. Yeah. Um, listen, yesterday was hard. Adam and I predicted or maybe not predicted, but we definitely stated that this 10-game road trip is going to... I mean, they started this season in a meat grinder, going four against the Rays at Tropicana Field. They got the split there. Big split, by the way. Um, we figured five and five was yep. a success. Yep. And honestly, four and six is keeping your head above water when you're going in to on the road into Tampa, into Houston, into New York. They did what they had to do in Tampa. Hop on that plane, head to Houston, and then we watched a very, very difficult game. I mean, boring if you're a Jays fan. No hits, no fucking hits. Just like, oh, mm -hmm. I, I. So with all of that out there, this isn't necessarily the most positive mailbag. I think that there is definitely some angst amongst the grounds crew and whether it's fair or not. That's where we're at. I think. We're we're riding a lot of energy from 2023, which I am trying to break. I don't I don't want that 2023 energy. I understand that a lot of this organization has just been run right back out there, and to expect that much change is maybe a little crazy. But I do expect some change. There are some bright spots. All that said, 157 games remaining, everybody. I know that Blue Jays Nation, after that 2021 losing out final game of the season, even hearing it's early, makes everyone a little squirrely. But, mm -hmm. but, it's early. <laughs> let's let's just rein it in a little, little bit. The sky is not falling yet. They've played some very good teams here in Tampa and Houston. And listen, Blanco getting a no-hitter. I don't think Adam would have marked that down on his bets in a million years. Lord knows I wouldn't card. have. It was not on the bingo card. That's a tough one to swallow, but here we are. So really, how does this team rebound? That's the big question. How do they look going into tonight's game? They've got Jose Barrios on the mound. Bowden Francis completely blew up yesterday. Bowden Francis looked good outside of all of the dongers he was given up. I love I love dongers instead of dingers, by the way. Me too. It's me every time. <laughs> but you give up four home runs while you're pitching in those uh I mean, good on him for getting into the sixth, I guess. I mean, needing to listen to to Buck and Dan talk about the value that Francis was adding by being able to get shelled well into the sixth inning was tough to swallow. But you know, if there are uh, if there is a bright spot, I guess. He saved the bullpen a little bit. I, I... <laughs> you can yes. always reach out with your comments. <laughs> we go through all of your interaction every single week, and we really appreciate it. At Walk Off Podcast on Twitter, the Walk Off Podcast on Instagram. If you are a member of the Patreon, you get that automatic Patreon bump. All your comments and questions get answered every single mailbag. By the way, if we miss a comment or question, Please do not take it personal. Just send us another message. What happens is we get a pile of emails. And if one of us clicks into it and then doesn't 
Mark is uh, Mark still is important. The other person just misses it anyways. Things get missed. It's never personal. Just shoot us a message and we'll get it out there next time we're talking. Uh, and on that, let's get into it. We have to. Okay. We'll start with this one then. Um, Wyatt on Patreon messaged us and said, Hey fellas, question for mailbag opening day. Is it that the Orioles are that good or the angels are that bad? Both. I'd say it's a little of both. I don't think the Orioles are quite that good and the angels are quite that bad, but pretty close. That's pretty much what went on there. Angels scraped out a win last game though. Yep. Um, I feel about this division right now, just like quick surface level interpretation of where these teams stand. Orioles trail the Yankees right now. I mean, early, but mm-hmm. Yankees look really good against Houston. No denying that. Oh, they're they're five and zero. Oh. Are the Orioles still your, or were they? Because for me, they were favorites to win the division. I had picked the Yankees to win the division, oh, and I, I still feel that way. <laughs> um, but I, I think, I mean, Baltimore is good. Bal- yeah. Baltimore is not going to be as good as they were last year, but that's because winning 101 games is incredibly difficult to do, especially in an AL East where it's filled with good teams. I mean, right now, the Jays and the Red Sox are probably, and the Rays, the bottom three teams in this division. And who wants to play any of those three? I mean, out like who wants to play those teams? Yeah. Are the Red Sox, who the Red Sox play so far? Seattle. So they, they played, I mean, honestly, that Seattle Boston series wound up being a heck of a pitching matchup all around for the most part. I think uh, I think the Red Sox beat up on the A's yesterday. Yeah, so Red Sox beat the Mariners six four on opening day in Seattle. Then they lost one nothing. Then they lost four three in extra innings. Then they won five one on the final game of the, uh, that four game series. And then yeah, that four three loss in extra innings, dude. That would have been so hard to take as a Red Sox fan because it was one yeah. one going into extra innings, and then the Red Sox go up three one and then wind up losing it in the bottom of the inning. Like, ooh. Hey, by the yeah, way, yeah. friend of the show, uh, <laughs> Taylor Sacedo got the win. Yes, he did. The Mariners, so cool there. Yes, uh, and yeah, beat beat the A's nine nothing. This is honestly going to be frustrating here because the Jays, not to like, again, be too much of an apologist for the schedule and you still got to like play good against good teams and everything. But I'm looking at this Red Sox schedule too. I know last week we talked about the Orioles schedule and how they had it pretty like cushy to start the season. Mm -hmm. But the Red Sox, I mean, take it two out of four against the Mariners. Like that's legit. But now they got Oakland for three, then the Angels for three. And they do have Baltimore for three, but then it's back to LA to play the Angels for three. It's just like, we're going to be mid April. We're mm-hmm. going to have to like listen to all the, oh, don't fucking sleep on the Red Sox and all the Red Sox fans fucking roasting us on Twitter. Yeah. And like, huh, yeah. who's in the basement of the AL East now? Yeah. Dirty water. Hashtag dirty water. And then hashtag Bay, dirty water. Yeah. Bay comes around and they're like, oh. I mean, hopefully, but I don't know. I guess all this to say perspective, uh, let's keep things. It's, it's hard. It's, it is really hard to evaluate teams that haven't played each other, that haven't played com in common opponents either. Mm -hmm. Right. Like early in the year, you don't know what a team is. You know, if the maybe the Mariners are fucking awesome, so going two and two against the Mariners is really impressive. Or maybe the Mariners suck this year, and going two and two is kind of disappointing in hindsight. So uh, I don't know, but I do feel like we're, we're a couple weeks away from like 
wanting to panic because of our record and where we sit in the AL East. And I think we're going to look at like, oh shit, all five of us are going to be big dogs this year. And I think by the all-star break, one or two are going to fall back. And I hope that's not us. I don't think it'll be the Orioles. And we talked a little bit about this in the Patreon preamble, but the energy, the 2023 energy is still lingering like a like a a, a a fart in a room, you know? And it's just, everyone is just like, man, I just want this stink gone. And what really needs to happen for that to take place is the Jay-Z to go on a little bit of a run, man. We need to watch this team kind of click and figure it out. And we don't know what this team is yet. I, I, I know all the haters, all the naysayers are going to say, yes, we do. They're the exact same team. They're showing the exact same problems at five games in. Obviously, we're well aware that the other 157 games to be played were fucked. Everything is the worst. Atkins is horrible. By the way, Atkins is horrible. But, you know, this is the this is the sky is falling rhetoric. And I just don't think they're there yet. I, you know, like it, it it's so early. Again, there's another triggering term to a lot of people but it's april 2nd (laughs) they took two of two two out of four i should say against a very good raised team in a building that has been this organization's achilles heel for a decade can i ask you two two points of speculation yes first francis bowden your level of panic on him because everybody felt very high on this kid who had 30 innings last year in the majors and had a really impressive ERA. Like, didn't start, but every time he was in a game, he was rock solid. Mm -hmm. If he's our number five for an extended period of time, do you feel good about that? What is this first appearance sour your confidence in them or is it just a blip on the radar and it's not like any chris bassett had a bad game one too where where are you at with francis bowden so let's start with this grounds crew would love to hear where you are at on francis bowden because personally i'm a little concerned but i'm not panicking it was very obvious where his problem was you you cannot give up four home runs as a starting pitcher, you know, like it was donger after donger and it was just too much. Like, and he was, he was walking guys and then giving them up, you know, like again, we, we kind of touched on this in the, in the Patreon preamble too, but it's like, you know, needing to listen to Buck and Dan talk about the value that Francis was giving us by pitching into the sixth. I mean, if you can, that's some serious, uh, toxic positivity right there. that's toxic positivity even beyond this show's capability like wow yeah they were able to run francis out and he got shelled for six innings what a value my like value pick all right if there uh, is any positivities to take away from it honestly all of those all of those runs came off home runs so if he can limit the long ball that solves that problem. Can he? I don't know. Because man, were they all over his high fastball? Like oh, yeah. his 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 curveball is such a, a thing of beauty, and they were not getting good wood on that. But man, were they all over that fastball? Um. Then question. What's your two? level of concern? Like you watched it too. Like concerning. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I've never been a big Francis Bowden guy. Like I'm I'm hopeful that he can plug a leaky dam until Manoa figures his shit out or Tiedemann is good or you know, whatever the case may be. I don't I mean whatever. Ultimately, he's our fifth starting pitcher, so we're allowed to have a bad one if the other guys are good. I think Brios is going to have a good year. Gossman looks as good as ever. We just need to, like, 
be careful with ramping him back up and not letting the horse out of the gates at full steam too quickly, uh, Mm -hmm. which I think is something I do have confidence in this front office to do properly is to not let him throw a hundred pitches in his next start. Um, so yeah, he's, he's allowed to be bad. We're, if we have three and a half really good starters and one who's kind of like, eh, that sucks. Okay. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think he'll be this bad every start he has this season. Like if he gets 10 no. starts for the Jays this year, that might be his worst one. Hopefully is his worst one. But I think you'll have a couple where he's just like lights out and unhittable and is like, oh, mm-hmm. it looked awesome. And then I think most of his starts are going to be like, well, he gave us a chance. Yeah. You know, he gave up three runs over six innings. Gave us a chance. I mean, the truth, the truth of the matter is, Adam, had he given up three hits, allowed one run over six innings and they lost one nothing, like, does it make yesterday no, any easier to swallow it, it might make it harder <laughs> um so my next my next question for you then is have you been surprised at all to see Alec Manoa is in the dugout and what does that mean for how this team is probably going to approach the whole Alec Manoa situation because right now it feels like he's injured and once he's mm-hmm. back, he'll get rehab starts in AAA. But injured or not, I think he should be starting in AAA. But by having him with the team right now. It really does send a message that this guy is a Toronto Blue Jay. Right? It, it doesn't send the message of this, this man is depth. This is a dude who we're going to stash in AAA until he proves that he can play on the big league team what it says is that this guy's a big leaguer and once there's a spot it's his once he's ready to go it's his yeah and i mean you like that would alec manoa have done worse than bowden francis yesterday i can't is that possible (laughs) well there's two (laughs) other tidbits that i found interesting on the camera shots of the dugout yesterday I don't remember the timeline on seeing Alec Manoa, but he looked in good spirits. Mm-hmm. I, I wonder, I wonder if he was just like, this is shitty to say. Like, I wonder if part of him was like, it's nice. Go out there and suck. Bad for the team. Good for me. Good for me. Silently. It is. It yeah. is. And it him. is. It abs- Listen. It is objectively good for Alec Manoa. That have... Bowden Francis is struggling. Right. I don't know. Maybe I saw him in the first inning and it was not before the big home runs and whatever, but it just felt like, again, I will acknowledge, you can fact check me on this. Maybe the rest of the footage, the rest of the game, every time they showed the dugout, Manoa was bummed out with the rest of them. But it feels like he was a little bit smiley. And I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, this is me causing drama here because I know Alec Manoa listens to the show. Um, the other face that was the opposite was Boba Shett, who missed a second straight game with neck spasms. Looked miserable as yeah. we lost that game. He looked mm-hmm. as disappointed as I felt. Yes. And I love, I loved seeing that. I it, like loved bummed me it out too. in a way. But I was like, that's a guy. That's my guy. I don't know. I'm big boat. Big boat guy. Hey, and I know that baseball is about having fun and it's super important to play loose. And uh, teams are just at their best when they're enjoying each other's company, when they're all razzing each other and there's that camaraderie and it, it's a team moving forward. But there is something to be said for a guy. Let's use Ray Holiday. Yep. You ask any, any teammate of Roy Halladay throughout his Hall of Fame career, what he was like in the in the bullpen, in the clubhouse, and in the bench afterwards during his 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 outings. He was a beast. 
He was a machine. You didn't mess with him. You didn't. He was miserable when things weren't going his way. He was stoic when they were, right? Like he was all focus. Mm -hmm. He was all concentration. He was all intensity. And humans, there's a wide range of us. And for every Vladdy, there's a bow. And Bo takes it very seriously. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that's a good thing to have that sliver in the clubhouse, right? To have that, that ying to Vladdy's yang. And then Manoa is just like, I'm going to get to pitch in the bigs again soon. <laughs> uh... Okay, with Boba Shet, there's no lineup announced for today. We probably won't see that for a couple hours. Um, Man, I hope it, he's playing. Doesn't feel like anything to be concerned about, but after getting no hit yesterday, and he's not on the IL, like this just feels like a day to day. He's tight. Mm -hmm. We gotta have him in the lineup today, though, right? I would hope so. Like, man. if he's not in the lineup, maybe this is maybe it's time to start being like, huh? Yeah, this is this scary. I don't know. I got such a kick out of the Buck and Dan discussion, pillow discussion as to how this neck injury could have happened. They were talking oh, about those oh, sometimes. That. Sometimes those those pillows on the road, <laughs> they're lumpy pillows, bad for the neck. <laughs> uh, uh. all right well i hope to see him out there again tonight um mish had a comment on patreon it says i find it curious that the two no hitters against us in the last two seasons were against quote pitchers of little consequence prior to them handing us our asses uh detroit last year which was i think a bullpen combo like it wasn't mm -hmm. a complete nine innings out of one guy um, and the Astros tonight, a fellow in his seventh career start. Um, where does the fault lie? Mish wants to know. Is it lack of proper research slash data from the khakis? Uh, depending too much on the khakis analytics and not making adjustments in real time versus past analysis. Uh, having a game plan going in and not adjusting on the fly. What's the problem here? Point a finger, Scott. People are going to hate this answer, but can we chalk it up to game five and move on? Like, I, I don't know. Like, Blanco was dealing. He was dealing. He really impressed me. I mean, to, he, pressed, he impressed me enough that I actually went out and picked him up on my fantasy baseball team. I was like, oh, this is a fifth starter that I might be able to get some points out of. <laughs> you traitor. How could you do that? How could you do that, Scott? I don't know. Like, when it comes to no hitters... There's a lot of luck. There is the fact that the guy is feeling it. Like the one point in that game where I was like, maybe he's going to give one up was literally with one out in the ninth. And it just looked like he was gassed. It just looked like he was overthrowing. He'd broken a hundred pitches. I think that had he not been throwing a no hitter, Houston would have taken him out after 90. You know, like I, he just looked like he was really pushing it. And so there were a couple of times in that Vladdy at bat where I'm like, Vladdy's going to get a hit here. Vladdy's going to break this up. And it just didn't quite happen. But there's also the thoughts of the batters, right? There's a psycho, there's the psychology to it but as well. These guys are, you know, stepping in. And then it once you start thinking about it, it, it piles it on, right? You know, you, you start thinking in the six, holy shit. Like it's. It's seven nothing, and we don't have a hit. And as soon as you start thinking that, you're gripping the bat tighter. You're doing weird things in the in the batter's box, right? Like you're trying to pick stuff up that maybe isn't even there. I, I mean, I don't know how to how to explain a no hitter. And I mean, if if we're gonna try and blame somebody, I, I don't know. 
Like, what are your thoughts, Adam? Is there like in a no hitter? Is there anyone to blame or do you like a little bit? There's a little bit of a tip of the hat to the pitcher, too. Well, of course, he had the game of his life. Yeah. Um. No hitters. I mean. Perfect game. Super rare. Yeah. No hitters. Quite uncommon. though. We're talking like three or four a season. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I'm looking back at the numbers. Um, over the last handful of seasons and teams that have been no hit. Um, that is to say, been on the receiving end, the bad yeah. side of a no hitter. I'm looking at multiple times for the Dodgers. Multiple times for the Yankees. Um, multiple time for the Mariners. Padres. This is not a reflection of the team who gets no hit is my takeaway here. Mm-hmm. Is that... Uh, I feel the same way. I, sometimes Good a guy just no has... All the time. Yeah, unhittable stuff. And again, as far as the Blanco factor of it all, a lot of no hitters come from guys that aren't Hall of Famers. I would say most of them. Mm -hmm. So the stars align sometimes. It's uh, it sucks to be on the receiving end of. I mean, to sit there and watch nine innings of it as a fan sucks, but it's not it in itself is for me uh, inconsequential as a data point on my panic meter. Mm -hmm. How's that sound? Um, I have reasons to panic, as anybody does. Um, I'm not panicking yet. But I would say the fact that we got no hit yesterday is like zero. It doesn't move the scale on my panic meter, which is, again, low right now. Frustrated, high. My frustration meter, high. Panic meter yeah. quite low. I'd say two or three. Um, and yesterday's no being no hit was like meh. Yeah, it is what it is. Like cool. Good and for and him. one point and of interest sucks to be on the wrong side. It, it does suck to be on the wrong side. And one point of interest that Buck brought up yesterday is that Blanco didn't have a change up last year, and he was working on a change up all spring. He threw a change up like twenty two percent of the time last night, and boy was he feeling it. Like that, I guarantee it was one of those moments where he's like, I've never been able to throw a change up like this. And just, he was putting it in the strike zone. He was getting the calls on the corner. And that was the other thing too, right? Is once a pitcher starts feeling it and is in that groove and has no hit a team after Mm -hmm. four innings, the umpire knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. So the umpire is going to give those guys some calls that are maybe borderline calls that he wouldn't have given in the first or second inning because the guy's been hitting his spot all game long, right? When a dude is dialed in, the umpire doesn't want to be the reason why a guy gets broken up in a no hitter or, or winds up, you know, walking two guys and then they score a run off a, a pass ball or something like that. Right. So just the stars align. Sometimes Blanco was feeling his change up more than he's ever felt it. And personally, and grounds crew feel free to drop comments here. Personally, I think the best thing this team can do is move on, <laughs> turn the page. Don't dwell too much on it. Chalk it up to game five. Understand that sometimes pitchers get hot. Sometimes pitchers have games like this that where they're, they just can rip through your lineup and dig in for today's game. Yeah, well put. Well put. I have nothing else to add on that. Uh... By the way, out of curiosity, because there's a lot of uh, anger online about the lack of accountability by this Blue Jays front office um, after yesterday's game. Right. I, and I, what did like, would have, would have you felt better about the loss? Had John Schneider not been like, Hey, Blanco had a hell of a game. Had he been like, we sucked, man, were we horrible at the plate? Like, what do you fit? Cause I don't get that mentality of like the, 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 the push for someone to take the blame for John Schneider to be like, yes, 
We did suck offensively. Uh, uh, no. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't, especially this early in the season, I don't know what any negativity from management accomplishes. What What it, would it, it benefit? Like, like what, the I, only I, thing should be talking about stability and confidence in the team moving forward because this is who we got. Like there's no, there's no trades happening this week. There's no, no one in AAA to call up to be like, our offense sucks. We're bringing up a Elvis Martinez. Yeah. There's no, there's no guy. There's no moves to be made. Like it's, that's something you can say in June when we're 20 games under 500 and you go, yeah, yeah you can call the offense, team out in June. Exactly. The offense fucking sucks. We've been scoring two runs a game for the last three weeks. These guys need to be fucking better. But on a one game sample size of like this particular game, like of course it did. 162. You're going to have games where the fucking offense sucks. Yeah. Every team in baseball is going to have that. So it's frustrating. We lost. It was a, it was a stinker of a game. Fucking buckle in. You're going to get 30 more of those this year. I hate to tell you. <laughs> Fucking, are you new to baseball? Uh, Welcome. It's a great sport. You're yeah, going to have a lot of fun. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of shitty days watching too. Yeah. That's that's it. That's it. That's my, okay. my hot take. I felt the same down. way. I just, like, the accountability thing, I just, I mean, it's game yeah. five. Like, what do you I want from them? Like. That, Relax. You don't. You don't think Justin Turner doesn't know that it it sucked? They all knew it sucked. <laughs> yeah, like fucking Bo Bichette looked miserable. I don't think he went into the dugout or the clubhouse and was kicking trash cans and yeah. fucking smarting up guys. Like, the only smiles on that bench was Alec Manoa. Big, big <laughs> smile from Alec. Great game, guys. Great, great game. <laughs> we'll get him next time, boys. We'll get him next time. <laughs> Pitching really let us down today. <laughs> All right, let's fucking move on to the next one then. Um, kind of related topic, but Devin says, holy shit, boys. This is from Twitter. Uh, watching the Jays get no hit last night was rough. This team has been absolutely shitty during all the losses and a treat to watch during the wins. Can we expect this inconsistency all year? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, yeah I, I think we can De i mean the truth is dear god i hope not <laughs> a happy medium would be all right because like what was it eight two and a nine two an eight two and a nine two win a four one loss an eight two loss and then yesterday's atrocity yeah i mean you've you've got of the possible outcomes for a game, you've got the offense is amazing and the pitching sucks. You've got the pitching was amazing and the offense sucks. Mm -hmm. You've got both were amazing and you've got both sucked. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, both sucked. Both sucked. You're just hoping that over 162 games, both are awesome, like a third of the time. Mm-hmm. And when it's not the case, you hope that when the hitting sucks, the pitching is good enough to squeak one out 2-1. And this is why and you got to flush yesterday's game. You have to flush yesterday's game because you start doing the math and start doing the calculations. And let's say the Blue Jays did get nine hits and score eight runs. They no still lost yesterday's game. A loss is right? a loss. It always is the same. Exactly. So, yeah, Bowden Francis pitches a gem and only allows one run. Guess what? They still lose that game. Exactly. It's the Roberto Luongo factor, right? Like, you can crap on him as a Vancouver Canucks fan because he had four terrible games against the Bruins in the Stanley Cup Finals. Mm -hmm. But he and also three had good three games, games weren't enough. that yeah. they won, and you had no business winning except for the fact that he stood on his head and you won one nothing three times. Like, you scored six goals in seven games. That's not the goalie's fault. <laughs> Although it still kind of is the goalie's fault. This is how it feels. That, that's yeah. what pitching is. That's what it's. Mm -hmm. It's what pitching it's, is. So, yeah, as far as the inconsistency and the roller coaster ride. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's going to happen. We're going to have really Hopefully awesome Hopefully it's games. not so drastic. Like, 
I, I would far rather see this team win five, three games or lose five, three than win eight, two or lose eight, two. It's just emotionally, <laughs> at least you're in the games, but. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, in discord, mustard tiger says, not ready to declare anything just yet. We've seen some ugly baseball so far, but we've also seen the whole team click, uh, which is what Devin was talking about. The injuries and suspensions are making things interesting. It's not the start to the season anyone hoped for, but let's give it another 20 games before we hit the panic button. That's a good point, too. No Romano, mm -hmm. no Eric Swanson. We've missed Boba Shett for 40% of the season. Not yeah. a good recipe for having an edge in any game. Especially when you're playing top tier teams. teams. Yeah, top tier teams. Um, by the way, last year's record for the Blue Jays, 89 wins, 73 losses. Our record versus teams over 500, 43 wins, 50 losses. Mm-hmm. Uh, against everybody else, 500 and below, we were 46 and 23. So that's the recipe for a 90 win season is try and play like close to 500 ball against the mm -hmm. top teams and run up the score as best you can against the Oakland Athletics. If the Jays can scratch out two to three more wins in these last five games before coming home to Toronto, that is that is paramount and it's huge and it's what should have been the goal coming into this road trip. And I think it is. And so they're that's, sitting two and three right now. That's the thing is at the end of this 10 game road set, we're four and six. We're going to be dead last in the American League East. Almost certainly, I would say. Um. Red Sox are already three and two, so they only need one win in their next five games to also be four and six. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we're also on the road. Like, there's a real home road advantage that happens in sports, and uh, it's tough to win on the road. So, if we can get four against good teams, there's some toxic positivity for you. That ain't bad. It's going to be disappointing, it's going to feel frustrating. And that's okay. But things aren't, I think, as bad as they feel yet. Now, when the Blue Jays come home at the end of this, April 8th, this is Monday, we got Seattle for three. We just split with the Red Sox. We got the Rockies for three. And then we got the Yankees for three. That's a nine game homestand. That's one where you go, well, we got to take four out of five of that. Or, sorry five out of nine in that right mm -hmm. but yeah ah, i hate so much that i'm already just like bracing for the impact of a four and six start to start the season yeah and a dead but i mean in the al east it, it you're a realist <laughs> yeah. you're a realist sorry you know how the game works like it's a tough road trip to start the season against some very tough teams Look, look at the Philadelphia Phillies, okay? The Philadelphia Phillies in 2022 were below 500 going into July. Had fired Rob Tom or uh, sorry, had fired uh Girardi, hired Rob Thompson, made it all the way to the World Series. Last year, by the way, the Phillies also were below 500 in June. You don't win the World Series in the first three months, you can lose it, but you got to keep your head above water when you're playing tough teams. And that's what we're just fingers crossed. The Jays can pull off here. <sighs> sure. Depressing Tuesday. Anyways, God, it's um, a depressing mailbag. <laughs> so let's talk this, uh, Genesis Cabrera suspension. Yeah. Here, let me double check if there's any news. So he pitched yesterday. Out of the yeah. bullpen. Um, there was a shoving match against the Rays that prompted the three-game suspension. It was appealed. So pending the results of that appeal, he is eligible to play. 
which is why he was in last night's game. Uh, the appeal process, as Dan and Buck talked ad nauseum last night, was expected to be determined or maybe had already been determined by the time of the game yesterday. Mm-hmm. And that the results of it were to be implemented today. Uh, as of the time of recording this, Nothing official has been announced. Whether the three-game suspension is upheld or whether it's reduced to two games, um, but he'll probably be unavailable for at least the next two games. So, of course, start him last night. Mm-hmm. Just Get to an inning or save an inning that. of the bullpen. Yeah. I mean, the value, is... Adam. The value he gave. <laughs> Look, honestly, this was the frustrating thing about that game yesterday. It was like we were down five nothing in the third inning. And it just felt like we had to punt. Mm-hmm. Like the whole game was a bit of a write-off. And I'm just glad we pitched Cabrera for like a inning and two thirds. And then Kiner Falefa for the ninth. So like we didn't deplete any of our actual bullpen stock that's going to be available for the rest of the series. And just sometimes you can get into that like we're chasing a loss and we're, we're rolling yeah. out Chad Green and Jordan Romano and Eric Swanson and Tim Meza because we're like only down three runs and like, oh, like you can't give up on any game. And like, I get it, but also does affect your ability to win the next game and the next game after that. So again, talks of positivity is, I guess, silver lining. Yeah. Francis Bowden was able to get us into the sixth. We were able to use a guy who was appealing a suspension the rest of the way, and then a position player to get us out of it. So the bullpen for today is as rested and ready to go as it could possibly be. Hopefully we don't need it. Rios on the Mm -hmm. bump. But that's good management. I mean, Mm -hmm. as much as we can criticize, and we spent a lot of fucking time criticizing John Schneider on the pre-show, that's good usage, right? Mm -hmm. So, put one gold star on the report card for how yesterday was handled in a a game that didn't matter, but still mattered. Listen, if there's bright spots, Jose Barrios looked incredible in his game. Kevin Gosman looked, for a guy not stretched out, looked unreal in his first start of the year. Uh, Mitch White came in in his outing and put together a couple good innings. Um, Chris Bassett is only going to get better. We're not going to... Chris Chris mm-hmm. Bassett is a, a guy where when he gets hit, he gets hit hard. It's rare. It's one out of every four or five times, and it was just his time. Mm-hmm. This pitching is still really good. Feel good about you, say Kikuchi? Yeah. You think he has a year? I mean, again, small sample size early, right? The 6.2 ERA through one start, four and a third innings pitched. Do you think he's closer to last year or the year before when this year's all said and done? I think he's closer to this year than last year. Or, uh, sorry, to the most recent he's, year, like he's, 2023 he's closer to 2022? 2023 than 2022, okay. uh, substantially closer. I think, I think his numbers aren't going to be quite as good as his career year last year, but I think that they're going to be close. So 3.86 ERA last season, 5.19 the year before that puts the midway point right around four and a half, almost mm-hmm. exactly. You think he's under a four and a half ERA this year? Yeah, I think he's under a four point two even. Yeah. Ooh, okay. I think if we got a four point two out of Yusuke Kikuchi, I'm happy. Yeah, so am I. A happy baby boy. Yeah, so am I. I think he's above four, but under four point two. So okay, love it. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that's that's it. Uh, The Cabrera suspension. I don't think there's any more info at this point. By the time you're watching this, there's probably more info. So. Apologize. Light us up in the comments. Yeah. You'd be an idiot if you want, but also check the stamp of the time that this got released. And they were talking on the broadcast yesterday, like it was going to be out last night. The appeals 
the appeal. Maybe it is. It might be. I, I can't. No, find I it looked, anywhere. man. It's. It, I mean, oh. it. it it would be on Twitter. One of one of Shy or Arden or Ben or something like that would have put it out, and it's it's not out. So not yet, anyways. If I was a betting man, I would say he's not pitching today, and I would place that bet through an interpreter. Um, okay, Scott. It's Syrup Season Adams on Discord says, "Seems like there's a narrative today on social media going around about how well Lourdes Gurriel Jr. is doing." Uh, remember, he was a free agent, so his performance from here on out isn't associated with the trade. No, that's not how it works. It will always be associated with the trade. He always should have been a Blue Jay, and this is why this team is not winning the World Series. Lourdes Gurriel Jr. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Honestly, I love Lourdes is doing well and good for the Diamondbacks. I, I really give huge praise to the Diamondbacks for going out there after going all the way to the World Series and really bolstering their lineups. A small market team went out and spent money when they could have really just rolled it right back. And instead, they bolstered their holes. They signed Lourdes again. They did what a lot of people didn't think they would do which was spend. Love to see it. Spend they did. Uh, they got, uh, what's the pitcher they got too at the end of the free agency? Uh, um, yeah, Montgomery. Montgomery. Montgomery, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah they picked up spend. Erod too, so Eduardo Rodriguez bolstering that lineup. They've got Brandon Fat probably going to take another step forward after his rookie season last year. He looked really good in the playoffs. Of course, so, Zach Galen is as, about as good as anyone out there in baseball right now. So, I yeah. I will I will say okay. So here's some data points for how you can form your opinion on Lourdes Gur Gurriel Jr. and whether we should have gone out and signed because we could have signed him right. Like we knew yeah. what kind of player yeah. he was. He's we knew a free what agent. we knew what Lourdes was. Yeah, he got a three year deal, so he's thirty years old currently. Uh, he'll be thirty one this year. Uh, three year deal, 42 million. So, like a 13 and a half annual average valuation, uh, with a player opt out after next season and, uh, or sorry, after this season, and then a club opt out for the third year. So, for me, I still can't hold this against Ross Atkins or commend him for it. Like either way, I can't, I can't make a decision on any of this stuff. Same with Tay Oscar or, or any of this until we see what plays out with Bowen Vlad. Mm -hmm. Because if, if that ends up being an extra $42 million that we need to fucking overpay Bo Bichette, Fuck, am I ever going to be glad we don't have Lourdes Gurriel Jr. and Teoscar Hernandez taking up, you know, $40 million combined per season for the next mm -hmm. three years? You know, like, I'll just be glad that that's money. Like, I'd way rather have Bo and Nathan Lucas as our third outfielder rather than miss out on Bo because we paid Lourdes and Teoscar to stay around. That's for me, that's where it comes down to. But yeah, if we lose out on Bo and, and Vlad anyways, and we end up getting nothing, then yeah, I'm going to be fucking bummed. And I'm going to hold that against Ross Hackins that in hindsight, hey, we should have just paid Tay Oscar and Lourdes the last two seasons that we had Bo and Vlad and, and had a, a, yeah. a, a, a chips all in run at a world series and say the window's closing, but we're going all in and here's what it is and, and blah, blah, blah rather than, but I just, I won't know until 12 yeah. to 24 months from now. So I just, we are going to hear a lot of talk about it. I'm sure on Twitter and whatever the comparisons, because Tay Oscar is leading baseball right now with four home runs for the Dodgers. So that's going to be something that comes up too. I think it was 18 million he got with the Dodgers. 23. Um, was it 23? Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's going to be frustrated fans, especially when the Blue Jays are on a offensive cold snap. 
We're like, oh, those 11 home runs from Teoscar in April sure would have been useful. And I just, I can't argue with it or agree with it until I see what what happens with Bo and Vlad. And that's, that's not a fun answer, but that's me being mm-hmm. as reasonably headed as I can be and fair. So what do you think? I mean, I don't know. Do you wish we had Lourdes on the team right now? No. I I like Lourdes Gurriel Jr. I like Teoscar Hernandez. I I mean, everyone acts like we didn't see what happened when they were on this team for five years. I, I, I Joel, don't see how they were the solution. Text us what you think when you hear this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, Joel's going to have a whole, it's going to be a, a text that fills up. Yeah. I'm going to have to scroll to read it. And it's going to be the yeah. breakdown of offensive numbers year by year with Tay Oscar and Lourdes versus what we're getting. And I'm not going to understand any of it except for the enthusiasm and the passion that Joel has for his response. And I look forward to it. So. I mean, did moving Tay Oscar and Lourdes cost them two games. I mean, I guess if you do the math, 89 wins in 2023, 91 in 2022. So, yes? <laughs> Were they still just wild card teams that freaking lost anyways? Got swept anyways? Yeah. I- yeah, it's... <laughs> it's, uh... I don't know if there's if, if there's one silver lining here. It's that Gabriel Moreno is having a terrible start to the season. So at least there's that. <laughs> at least there's that. Uh, the Not, poor kid. He'll get it together. <laughs> I'm sure it'll still be pointed out. He, his terrible offensive start to the season is still not as bad as Dal- Dalton Varsho's terrible start to the season. Yes, so yes. throw that point right back in my face. Um. Okay, well, we'll end on this one then from Patreon. Matt says, uh, quick question for the mailbag. What's one way too early bold prediction that you both have? Mine is that the Astros miss the playoffs. That's from Matt Finley. For what it's worth, he did send that in before they no hit us. So, Matt, Mm -hmm. that affects your bold prediction. Send me an update. But as it stands right now, it probably doesn't. Um. What's your what's your bold prediction there, Mr. Belford? I think my bold prediction is going to be that the Tampa Bay Rays finally don't have that does. magic touch anymore to lose the pitching that they lost over the offseason, to lose their star shortstop that was supposed to be the cornerstone to this franchise for a decade to come. I think that just it's going to catch up with them. And I mean, listen. I have said this before, (laughs) so take that with a grain of salt, I guess. But yeah, going into this season, I just, I I really combed through this Rays lineup and I just, I just can't see how they are. I I think they're still going to be a pain in everyone's ass. I think they're probably still an 85 win team. I just don't think they're quite a wild card team, but. Damn, that was like almost exactly my prediction was that the Rays Come back down to earth. They can't keep pulling cards out of their butt. But they're still probably going to be above 500. Yeah. But not a threat for 100 wins. Yeah. Um, Damn. Okay, well, I'll think of something else real quick then. I'm going to say... By the All-Star break, Justin Turner has the best OPS on the Blue Jays. Ooh, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> well, I mean, Brandon Belt did that for us last year, so yeah, who knows? Yeah, um, but yeah, I uh, I'm enjoying Justin Turner as a Blue Jay. Me too. So I just want to ride fit. that wave while I can. I think we we're hearing on uh, Blair and Barker yesterday. They were talking about his approach at the plate and swing in 80 percent just taking the approach of like 
you know, like when you have runners on base, I think it was to just swing 80% treat it like batting practice and just like, you don't need to fucking blast the seams off the ball. And, uh, fuck, can he ever hit the ball? Anyways, if that's an approach that works, I'm not saying it yeah. does, but if it does, I hope it's infectious and I mm-hmm. hope we can, uh, hit better with runners in scoring position. And I hope we have a few less noble tigers this year. If you know what I mean, if yes. you don't know what a noble tiger is, Google it. And then let me know in the comment section, how sweet of a term that is. Justin Turner got a lot of hate from people thinking that he's washed up and it doesn't feel that way. Nope. Right. A, so far a lot right of now, people were good. like, he's too old. He came off a career year last year. Listen, there is something to be said for a dude who is a professional hitter at 39. Yep. You don't get there without being really good in that batter's box. And that's what Justin Turner is. And we have seen throughout this season, I know we're only five games in, but when runners are in scoring position, Justin Turner has driven him in. And that was a big, big hole in this Blue Jays game last year. Do you think... There is a, I mean, of course there's a benefit to having a veteran presence, but the veteran presence of like real age in a locker room, right? Like when we brought George Springer in, he was World Series experience, playoff experience, veteran presence, right? Good influence on these kids, the Bows and the Vladdies, the kids who it's been their locker room and, you know, who can put them in place or whatever, right? But now you bring in a guy that's 39 years old, Justin Turner, who's been there, done that, World Series with the Dodgers. To look at a guy, like you said, a professional hitter who's just been a professional hitter two decades or a decade and a half or whatever. Be like, he has real weight, real gravitas behind what he says when he's given tips and feedback in a way, even I think George Springer doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Sustained success over a long period of time like that is hard to ignore. And it is hard to dismiss when someone's giving you tips in batting practice or chatting with you, sitting in coach on the airplane or whatever. Right. And now as I'm saying this, I wonder if there's a value in having Joey Votto in this lineup too. Mm -hmm. In the way that like, Davis Schneider, right? If you had a crystal ball and you could just look at two paths and you're only looking at the numbers of two guys, right? Uh, The numbers of Bo and Vlad and the rest of the team, still a mystery in this crystal ball. But you can see one path in which Davis Schneider plays, let's say, 100 games. It's 100 games for him or 100 games for Joey Votto. Davis Schneider statistically, offensively, has a better season, right? Maybe 25 home runs, 270 batting average, whatever. Joey Votto, same amount of games played in the other scenario, maybe like 19, 15 home runs, like a 265 batting average. But do you think, because here's what I feel. I feel like I'd rather have Joey Votto because I feel like the rest of the team would be influenced from the veteran presence of a guy who's 40 and has just been a professional hitter. And the influence that, like, I don't know. I just, there's an impact on a guy like that or a guy like, I mean, we saw with Marcus Simeon. I know he doesn't have the age that we're talking about in this specific scenario, right? But like the impact that a guy like Simeon had on Bo Bichette and 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 Danny Jansen, right? And just like mm-hmm. the confidence and what he's bringing to the table and and whatever, I feel like I would trade six home runs for that. 
I don't know. Am I crazy? And the question is, do those do those six home runs get made up in his and home advice? runs by the other guys? Exactly. Right. Because there is there is real value to having a guy who could go up to somebody who's struggling. Let's use David Schneider as an example. We watched how hot he was last year, and then he really hit that wall where he went, I think it was like 0 for 30 stretch or something like mm-hmm. that at the plate. I, I know a lot of that had to do with just he wasn't getting put out there all the time, so it's tough to break out of a slump when you're playing every third game. But to have a dude who can go up to David Schneider and be like, listen, in 2012... I went on an 0 for 28 stretch against left-handed hitters. And what they were doing to me is they were doing this. Mm -hmm. How I eventually came out of it is I did this. We're all humans. We all do things differently, but maybe you want to give this a try. And even just the fact that he's sitting there talking with a Kevin Biggio is like 2012. I wasn't even, I wasn't even in the league. Like I was, I was just starting my run as a professional baseball player, right? Having those guys be able to like start those stories with again, right? I just become an everyday player with the Dodgers. It's 2009. My left foot was sore. You know, like what? (laughs) He's seen it all. He's been through it all. He's done it all. He's come out of stuff. He's slumped more than any of these. Like he's slumped more than some of these guys have ever slumped. He's been hotter than some of these guys have ever been hotter. There's just real value in that. And right. does it make and up I, for, in your example, the six home runs? I don't know, but I think but there's that's something that's there. Just to, to add to what you're saying, though, is like he can tell that story to David Schneider, who of course is going to listen. But I just think a guy like Justin Turner or Joey Votto can also say that to Bo Bichette or Vlad. Mm-hmm. And they'll and they'll be more likely to listen to 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 Joey Votto, who's having a very pedestrian forty year old season, and be like, "Yeah, maybe my leg kick is too bad, or maybe when I'm whatever, I'm opening up too much, or maybe my hands yes. are too high. Maybe this guy knows what he's talking about. This like Hall of Fame potentially guy might have genuinely helpful feedback. Whereas if David Schneider goes over to Vlad and is like. Laddie, listen, bud, you really yeah. gotta, you know, it's like, okay, Davis, fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm Vlad, you're Davis. Even George Springer, having Justin Turner go up to almost anybody, but let's, let's right. use George Springer, right? And be like, listen, kid. And George is like, oh, wow. I haven't been called kid in some time. Thank you, sir. Uh- <laughs> Getting ID'd again. Here we go. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I just, I, I, I just, I, I, everything you said, I agree with. And I, I think that's the plan. I mean, Votto's probably on this team as soon as he gets an opportunity and he's, he's healthy. I think they're going to really give Votto a chance. I don't know, man. I, I, I still really don't know how to feel about this team. Like maybe I'm trying we, to be positive and hopeful. We, we talked about playing the hot hand uh, in the pre show. David Schneider, Ernie Clement, uh, IKF. We haven't seen any Daniel Vogelbach. Have we seen him at all? Yeah, he was in the lineup once, I think, uh, in that Rays series against the lefty that was on the mound there. I guess, okay, so I guess what I'm wondering is maybe, yeah, I don't know. Maybe the hot, maybe we're going to just spend the next couple of weeks going, it's not about finding the hot hand. It's about finding the cold hand. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. it's about finding the guy we can cut. Yeah. Bring up Joey Votto. Like, we're going to, we're going to go on a race to the bottom, which doesn't sound fun. But like, maybe it's necessary to be like, hey, we know. Davis is hot. Hey, we know Clement is hot. Hey, we know, you know, but it's like, Mm -hmm. maybe those guys aren't the guys that Joey Votto takes a spot from once he's ready to go, right? Like once he's healthy and he looks like he's hitting well enough to contribute, maybe like, well, he's not taking fucking Ernie Ernie Clement's job, right? But maybe Mm -hmm. he's taking IKF's job or maybe he's taking Justin Turner's job or maybe he's taking Danny Berger's job. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
I don't know. I'm. I, I I'm just waiting for the comments to be like, "Oh, Adam fucking loves Joey Votto." Suddenly, I'm like, always liked him. Like as a ball player, as a contributing yeah. member of this team, still like him. Rooting for yeah. him. I think he can do good. It's just the the pseudo Canadian story of it all that. Yeah, is my only is my only gripe. But like, yeah, into, as a yeah. ball player, as a veteran presence, as an influence on these kids. I like the move. I like the ad and I'm excited to see what he can actually do with this team. But yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a lot of rambling for a Tuesday. Well, let's wrap it up there then. Thank you everybody for all your interaction throughout the week. We do really appreciate it. Feel free to DM us on Twitter, a walk-off podcast, Instagram, the walk-off podcast, a big tip of the hat to all of the Patreon members out there. I know that that group grows all the time every week we seem to get another guy or two or lady or two coming in and and it is very much appreciated of course with patreon you get uh us rambling off the top of all of our shows so you get the added extra bonus you get the mlb the real Mondays. emotional content the, the real emotional content where our takes aren't quite so <laughs> level-headed uh you get mlb mondays so we do that every single monday you get every wednesday our writer's room where we're putting together around the horn, the show we're writing. And then on top of that instant access to all of our interviews, we were supposed to talk with Ro Will Robertson and Jordan Powell. Right. Powell, of course, the knuckleballer and Will Robertson, probably the next layer of depth when it comes to outfielders. He's a lefty in Buffalo right now. Uh, friend of the show. We had him on back in 2021. They had to move their interviews. So, Hopefully sometime this week or next week. Anyways, it is lined up. Arden Zwelling of Sportsnet also has agreed to talk to us in April. So, so hopefully in the next We're week We're allowed or to two, have the Sportsnet got... guys on? Or is this an off the record, <laughs> sneaky backroom shadowy? <laughs> oh, this is exciting. Oh, yeah, that's right. Try and stop us from, from convincing these guys to come on. Uh, yeah, so we do have some stuff coming up again. Patreon does get you intro instant access to that and access to our discord. So there you go. There's the pitch. Thank you so much, everybody for following along grounds crew, leave your messages below and hopefully we get to them next mailbag. Take care of yourselves. Cheers. Go Cheers. Jays.